Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our readers and listeners of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position, along with your favorite beverage, to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine the show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Dave V., Jared W., and Andy J. Ryan King has joined us on the show today. Ryan is Vice President, Corporate Development and Investor Relations for Caliber Mining, a producing development and exploration gold company with various stage assets in Nicaragua. The company is listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol CXB, and also on the U.S. OTC markets under the symbol CXBMF. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me, Andrew. Appreciate being here and uh, look forward to the discussion. Well, good to finally get you on. Ryan, I know we've been chatting for quite some time now, and uh, it's good to have Caliber finally on our show. For the audience, can you tell us about your background, Ryan, in the sector and what attracts and keeps you in the sector? Absolutely, yeah. So I've I've been involved in mineral exploration and and mining since uh, going back to 2003 and four. I made some good decisions along uh, that uh, experience and history, and made some poor decisions, (laughs) as everybody has. But you learn along the way. And um, what keeps me in the sector is actually uh, I'm fortunate enough to work with some really good people: Uh, Douglas Forrester, Blaine Johnson, Doug Hurst, Ray Threlkeld. Over my career, I've worked with George Salamis. and continuously, I come back to the quality of the people that I work with. But, you know, Andrew, if I take a step back and I look at the sector, it's a, it's a, it, every year I feel like it's getting smaller and smaller of an investment sector for the general public. And to me, that kind of represents an opportunity in the sense that as it gets smaller, um, people identify the quality opportunities. And as it gets smaller, there's sort of, a I, I guess, a niche opportunity. And if you really sift through it, I think... I, it was years ago I read a book that Warren Buffett said, get to know uh, a specific sector really, really well. And if you do that, you can you can be successful. And that, that's really my been my goal over the years. It's not bouncing around between various different sectors that pop up in the Vancouver um, small cap, early stage, um, I guess, entrepreneurial companies, for example, cannabis, uh, cryptocurrencies and different things like that. That, that can really detract people from, from what their focus is. So yeah, I guess it's that. It's also it's also the the metals complex themselves. I think you know we consi- consistently and continually will always need metal that's coming out of the ground if you can responsibly and economically discover it, advance it, uh, and and sustainably and and safely mine it. Then it's uh, it can be a really valuable uh, asset. So, I mean, gold, copper, silver, all of these different metals um, come and go with cycles, but. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's it's really an interesting space to be in. Yes, absolutely, and some good points uh, that you bring up, and I think there's going to be continued opportunity here, and it's certainly not going away anytime soon. And as you highlight, if you can narrow down and stick with good management, um, that provides a good opportunity for the for the folks who can do that. And as the sector gets smaller, potentially, you can get into a better pool as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's that's some good stuff you brought up. Can you speak to the new market success for a moment, Ryan, uh, going back a couple of years? What were the key factors that led to success there? And then have you been, through your experience with this management team, have there been some ventures that have not been a success yet or just haven't worked? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so first we'll talk about new market because that was our most recent success and it was an incredible success for everybody that was involved. You know, I, I'm going to step on a limb here and say a lot of times management teams get get incredibly lucky. Um, I, I feel that mineral exploration is as much an art as it is a science. When we step back, I'm, look, I'm not a geologist, but so often there are clear scientific signatures that show um, excellent uh, discovery potential, expansion potential, and they don't pan out. For whatever reason, the vein kinked when it should have jogged. For whatever reason, uh, an un- unbeknownst fault has come through and displaced a huge portion of mineralization. There's just so many factors involved in earth sciences. But, you know, uh, with New Market, 
we identified an opportunity that had lack of exploration dollars, near mine exploration dollars spent on numerous targets. And it wasn't at the fault of management that was currently running the company at the time. It was just a function of the, of the environment that we were in, in the sense that gold price had been coming down, uh, the assets, the, the, the operating cash flow assets being at that time Stahl, Fosterville and Cosmo weren't performing as well, grade wasn't reconciling well, recoveries were poor, therefore operating cash flow was poor and therefore they didn't have the excess capital to invest in exploration. So it was 2013, we started the vehicle new market gold. You know, and, and it, was, it was led by Douglas Forrester, Blaine Johnson, Doug Hurst, Raymond Threlkeld, all of which had numerous, numerous years of experience, uh, not only in the capital markets in engineering, but also geology. So it, it, you know, we had looked at, I'm gonna say hundreds of opportunities, whether it be early stage exploration, uh, advanced stage exploration development to production and it, and it was this opportunity that that was brought to us and therefore this opportunity that we went on and and, uh, and, and acquired and it largely was due to the numerous exploration um, geological opportunities in front of us it wasn't just one you know target it was it was I'm going to say 10 to 15 targets at each of the mines that hadn't been drilled that presented opportunity for resource expansion and potentially new discoveries. And yet, if you look at the history of those assets, they had performed uh, relatively well. Fosterville, not as much. You know, it was the Stahl mine, it was the Fosterville mine and Cosmo mine. And, and, and uh, you know, if I look through uh, history, it was, we, 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 we acquired Crocodile Gold and, and merged it with New Market Gold. We raised $25 million, which at the time was incredibly difficult, the summer of 2015. I think the day before we announced the deal, gold price dropped $50 to $60. So, you know, in those headwinds, it's incredibly challenging to raise equity for a new gold venture, even especially a gold venture that had been uh, not successful, not successful in the sense that it wasn't generating good cash, uh, you know, it was losing money, grade was, was going down, uh, double refractory which uh, recoveries were poor. So, but, uh, you know, w through the due diligence that Doug Hurst, Ray Threlkeld, Doug Forrester and others performed, they, they recognized that it looked like a, a really good opportunity for some potential geological success. And so we closed the deal. Uh, the board actually put 10, you know, probably 11 or 12 million of the, of the, of the $25 million into the equity. So that, that in itself, I think people should step back and really recognize when management and board put a significant amount of capital to work in a venture. I mean, it, it, it's, self, it's a self-motivator. You know, everything is a self-motivator. And when you look at that, um, it's, it's a very good sign for the sector. When, when people are putting their own money in, they say, you know, I'm starting a new business, but I'm putting my own money to work here because I really believe, and based on my experience, I really see an opportunity here. So I think that's an important factor. But not to digress too much, but I, I will say that, you know, as we got in there and started to drill, we had success at each of the mines, albeit some better than others. But uh, but it was it was the the team there that I think identified the opportunity. They saw the numerous targets, were able to raise enough capital uh, to to go back in and drill a number of those targets. And really, since since 2015. You know, I think our, our first announcement was probably Q4 of 2015, where we started to get into some high grade material uh, down, down plunge from where we're currently mining at Fosterville. And that really shifted everything. It was a different type of mineralization. It was more free gold. Uh, we changed the mill um, and therefore the rest is history. And, and, then, and then really what happened out of that is, is because we had the exploration success, the stock started to perform well. It attracted investors like Eric Sprott, who, who became a very significant shareholder in the company. Um, again, Eric is a, is a very wise investor. He identifies opportunities. And then, and then it, was, it was Doug Forrester and it was Blaine Johnson that at, at the right time with the exploration success, grade was incredibly increasing. Recoveries were getting better because of new mineralization. Uh, new mineralogy uh, was was getting recovered out of the out of the mill well. We actually added the gravity circuit, so a lot of different things led to a point in time where 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 we stepped back as management and said, okay, how do we accretively grow the business? 
and make a very successful financial product that is a, that is a gold-based product. And by doing that, uh, we, we can see significant share price appreciation for our shareholders and future shareholders. And, and that was where we came to the conclusion that the best scenario after doing all of the review was to, to merge with Kirkland Lake Gold. And uh, with the combination of the Canadian assets, the Australian assets, uh, big reserves at Macassa, um, with the exploration potential and huge upside at Fosterville, we thought it was going to be a really good fit. And luckily, it worked out really, really well. But I, I, I go back to we were lucky in the sense that, um, yes, the geologists identified a good opportunity, but there's been times in the past where it hasn't worked out. And so, uh, you know, you know, we were lucky to find incredibly high grade to dramatically change the, the landscape at that mine. And that was Fosterville. And certainly it was a great success and uh, we had followed the company and I believe uh, I had to go back and check, but I'm pretty certain I own the stock for a, for a time personally and did quite well. How about for the management team generally? Uh, is there anything else right now that the management team has been challenged with or has had some some not so much success yet? Uh, not speaking of caliber yet, um, the jury's still out, but can you speak to any others that management may have had some tougher challenges? Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's where I was going to lead into it. And in fact, we have, um, you know, I'll go back and I'll use Caliber as an example, because it's a, it's kind of a case in point for a couple of reasons. One is Caliber mining really was spawned out of, out of uh, some early stage exploration assets in Nevada, in Australia, and they didn't, they didn't work out. And, and, and at the time it was, you know, it was founded by Doug Forrester, Blaine Johnson, that didn't work out. They had to pivot but stuck with the deal and then acquired some some assets in Nicaragua from Yamana in 2009, brought in a, a new CEO, a, a good geologist to help foster the assets along and, and, uh, and hopefully have some exploration success because there had been past production in these areas. We call them the Barosi concessions. There was, uh, I think, a total of 8 million ounces had been produced in the past so we, we saw that as a really good opportunity. I mean, it's, it's cliche, but you know the saying, you know, the best place to find more gold is around a gold mine. And uh, so we started to get in there. And of course, the market rolled over uh, to, to the downside. Gold price started to really come down significantly. And it became more and more of a challenge to raise equity to advance exploration projects. And uh, that, that, that's when we again pivoted and were able to attract, because of the geology, because of the past production in the, in the jurisdiction, in these assets, uh, we were able to attract uh, B2 Gold to come in as a uh, earn in joint venture partner. We were able to attract I Am Gold, who is uh, earning in and is still a joint venture partner. B2 Gold has stepped back, of course, from that uh, in 2015 16. And then we were also able to attract Sentara. So, so the geology is there, the targets were there. It was very difficult to raise the cap on, and subsequently it was. Uh, the share price did not perform well. And, and, you know, we had to go continuously back to the market to raise capital because we would identify new opportunities to drill and the market would say, yes, drill those. And we would go in and drill them and we just didn't have the success we were hoping to, hoping to get. So, so Caliber has been one of those um, challenged equities that we've continuously uh, advanced, but, uh, but we, just, uh, we just haven't had the success we had, had been hoped for. So after the new market success, the you know it was Doug Hurst and Doug Forrester and Blaine Johnson that, that sort of stepped back and recognized, you know, if we can acquire some some mines that are currently in operation that have uh, decent uh, operating cash flow that we can identify and maybe focus on and 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 have some positive impact on, then then maybe there's an opportunity to to, to duplicate new market gold. And so that's when again Caliber pivoted. <clears throat> We we uh, we rolled the stock back ten for one, which was which was not fun. You know, we every one of us in the company has put significant amount of capital into the equity and never sold a share. And uh, so for me, that was that was a setback. That was a challenge because uh, not only being a, a member of the team for a number of years, but also putting a lot of my own hard-earned money in that. It's tough to swallow, but you stick with the deal. You know, we consistently stuck with the deal, and again, we had to pivot again to to try and find a way to make it successful. And here we are today. We've we pivoted. We've raised the hundred million dollars. We've we've got cash flowing operations in Nicaragua, and then that'll lead us to further exploration and hopefully some exploration success. But putting Caliber aside for a second, I know we'll talk more about that. But putting that aside, 
I've been involved in a company called Terrain Metals, which took quite a long time, a big copper gold porphyry in British Columbia. You, know, you talk about different jurisdictions and, and British Columbia is a challenging one from a permitting perspective. Uh, very challenging in BC to get projects permitted. And it took us six, I think almost six years from the time we acquired the asset when, when Gold Corp and Bear took over Placer Dome to the time that we got an EIA approved for, you know, and, you, and in BC, you have to get a provincial and a federal. And it was just, and so many other hoops and whistles to go through. We finally got that permitted. And then of course we sold that, but it took a long time and, you know, share price went up and it went way, way down. But the point is we stuck with it again and, and eventually sold that company to, to uh, Thompson Creek, which was acquired by Sentara. One, one I'll say that I've been involved with, it's been a challenge. Uh, was called Edgewater Exploration. And, and some of your listeners may remember it, some may not. Uh, the CEO, George Salamis, and, and myself, and Doug Forrester and Blaine Johnson, we acquired the asset in Spain from Lundin Mining, uh, a great looking small gold project, one, one million ounces. Uh, we, we raised, uh, I think, a total over the, over the life of the, that we had the asset, 50 or 60, 70 million dollars, and put about 40 to 50 into the asset drilling, uh, uh, engineering work, permitting work, social work, you name it. Uh, you know, this this is an asset that was away from any bodies of water. This was an asset that was in, the, in, the, in a rural area, uh, you know, farming area, uh, not impacted by any houses, nothing like that. We got it right to the finish line. Uh, we are almost done a, a, a feasibility study, a final feasibility study, and the, and the government stopped us from advancing that project. So, you know, I would, I would say maybe not necessarily management's fault. However, it was one that didn't succeed that we would have hoped would have succeed because it was a good looking project with 1.7 million ounces of gold that we had grown it to and, and done all the work. So, so actually, in fact, that one is still in a, in a uh, international arbitration suit with, uh, with the government of Spain, and we're waiting for the outcome of that. So there, there's just a few examples, right, of, of, successes and failures and and uh and we we just keep pushing forward that's good stuff and spain boy i mean you think bc's bad spain's got to be terrible for a jurisdiction <laughs> you know uh, it, yeah i mean I, I i go back to that and i and when we were there back in 2010 11 and 12 it was incredible how welcoming they were. I mean, there's a lot of copper mines there. There's there's a lot of mining that happens in Spain. However, you know, I I, I don't know what it was, but you know, with 20% unemployment, they were looking at all different avenues for jobs. We were in a fast track in permitting. There were so many things that were working in our favor. And then, you know, you spend all this money and you get to the finish line, and they just put their hands up and said, no, 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 not here. Very odd. There, I know there were some difficulties with a uranium company trying to get a mine permitted built and just one problem after another. Um, not an ideal jurisdiction in my view. I, I haven't had a high opinion of Spain uh, for jurisdiction for mining uh, ever. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the broad market for natural resources, Ryan, just stepping out a little bit um, to the gold market. Comments on where we are and realistically, are we in a sustained choppy trend higher for gold over the next several years? Yeah, great, great question. I mean, you know, uh, it was just a couple of weeks ago we saw this massive volatility, and I think, and I think, obviously led by the geopolitical volleying back and forth uh, with the United States, um, and and I think that's not going to change. I mean, we're going to consistently see that, but I think it's best if if we 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 as a sector and an industry do a good job of educating on these types of on these types of blips that will happen. I mean, I I try to pull back from that a little bit and say, well. You know, this, this isn't fundamental. I mean, gold in itself really is fundamental, but this isn't fundamental because you've got all this geopolitical uncertainty happening and, uh, and, and for sure you're going to see gold price spike on that. And so let's just wait until that sort of subsides and, and comes down, in which case it, it has been, but, you know, not as probably uh, not as much as people would have potentially thought. And I think that speaks to where we are in the, in the macroeconomic landscape. In, in the sense that it's not just the United States, it's not just Canada, it's, it's, it's so many different countries around the world that are, that are having uh, fiscal issues. Uh, you're not seeing the economic growth you would hope for. The quantitative easing that had, that had been put to work by the, by the different, um, 
by the different banks uh, hasn't hasn't been well, it's been successful, I think, to some degree. But it, now we're at a point in time where what else is going to be used to try and stimulate the economy? And, and there's not a lot of other uh, not, not a lot of other, other options other than interest rates and different things. But but so I I, I don't see the massive amount of resistance on the gold price. I mean, it's always going to be there because it doesn't yield a, a coupon or, or have interest. But but I, I do see, you know, this is this is probably the new norm, you know, between fourteen and, and fifteen hundred dollar plus gold, and and I think, you know, myself, I, I can only see it going higher, not 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 violently higher, like you're not going to see, I don't think five thousand or ten thousand, but, you know, I think somebody somebody said at one point in time that you know the price of gold is like a fine suit, and they go up and buy a fine suit, you know, equate it to inflation. What is the price of a fine suit today versus 10 years ago versus 20? And you can probably correlate that fairly accurately to the price of gold. Whereas what does a fine suit cost today? You know, you can, you can debate that. You know, it's probably somewhere between $1,500 and, and $2,000, right? Uh, Canadian anyways. Uh, but, but, but so putting that aside, I, I would say, you know, you're probably going to see this relative equal valuation uh, to inflation and the price of gold, and is is it, it, you know I I think I think also a contributing factor here is the massive amounts of debt that uh, are just going to probably get continuously worse um, because people have this lifestyle now that they don't want to go away from, and uh, and how are you going to get out of that problem? I don't know, uh, but it but it's 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 contributing to the gold price. And I think it's the biggest contributor to the gold price. And once these uh, U.S. stocks kind of start to roll over and slow down, it's inevitable. It will happen. We don't know the timing, of course. But when that happens, you know, when the strength of the U.S. dollar slows down a bit, uh, I think, you know, you're really going to see some positive impacts on the gold price. Um, You know, so even though it's uh, hard to say what and how and and what that will mean, but uh, I think it's going to happen. But I think it's just going to go slow and steady, and yeah, it'll be volatile. But um, and so it's 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 educating all investors that just be careful with this because you know you know it, it it's it's been uh, it's been challenging <laughs> to say the least, especially over the last you know I talk specifically about gold it's over the last five, six, seven, eight years in the gold space, uh, and so people have lost a lot of money. Thoughts on other precious metals and base metals, Ryan? Well, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to uranium for a second. I, I, at some point in time, that's gotta that's gotta start to really see a a, a, a bigger impact on price positively because, it, you know, I, I think with the world going to get getting away from oil and getting into different energy sources, that that's gotta be a, a you know a significant commodity that that the world starts looking at more and more in time. I, I'm not at all. Uh, really specifically intelligent in, in that sector, that commodity. So I can't speak too intelligently, of course, about it. But um, and then you know, t- taking a step back, copper is going to be a big one. I think we're going to see a massive run in copper soon. It's going to take some time as we work through the the economies and the and the situation that we're in. But but uh, you know, copper is a big one. There really hasn't been any new significant large copper deposits, and they're all getting mined out. It's getting lower and lower grades. So. You know, you're going to have to have uh, a, a decent price to start mining it uh, economically. You know, w- one that sort of caught me by surprise over the recently is is, um, is palladium. It's it's been it's been having a pretty significant run, but uh, and and I'm sure largely due again to the to the supply demand situation. But yeah, I mean, uh, there's lots you could point to, and and I think for me, probably the biggest one longer term will be copper. It it'll be It'll be a commodity that we well. When you look at um, you know even cobalt, but when you look at these uh, uh, the way the world is going with respect to electric vehicles and uh, down this electric path, uh, you you know copper is is going to be needed so much more. I, I saw a presentation by Robert Friedland. Uh, of course, you got to be careful with your wallet when you watch those because you want to go and buy a stock right after. But uh, but he 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 made an incredible <laughs> point uh, on copper and how how it, it it it's just so important to to the world and and to the economy that uh, if anyone hasn't seen his presentation which is probably about an hour and a half long on copper and 10 minutes long on on his on his companies but <laughs> but but it he proves the point and he's got a lot of facts and statistics to back it up so so you can see why it's so important 
Well, we're certainly big fans of uranium um, and also copper. Uh, Ivanhoe's been a long time holding for us and, and we've done well. And Ivanhoe's just nice because it's kind of a, in some respects, it's kind of a one-stop shop because of their suite of metals that they do have. But certainly gold as well fits in there quite well for us. And uh, so it is going to be a interesting couple of years ahead, Ryan. Well, let's talk about Caliber. So this company has transformed substantially over the past six, eight months. Can you tell us about the transaction with B2 Gold and why management sees value in B2's old Nicaragua assets? Well, I guess just a little bit on the transaction. Uh, you know, again, I kind of go back to the new market success in the sense that it was it was the acquisition of cash flowing assets. And the best place to find more gold is around a gold mine. And we'd been operating, albeit as an exploration company in Nicaragua for 10, 10 plus years. So we were we were aware of the jurisdiction. We knew the rules and regulations in terms of permitting for drill pads and social license, et cetera. Um, and, I, and I think uh, the same was thought from B2 about us. You know, these guys know the jurisdiction. They've operated there for years. And, and, and there's relationships. I mean, B2 guys, I think, know our founders, Doug Forrester and Blaine Johnson quite well through, through being, you know, plus 30 years in the business and uh, coming across paths. And, and Blaine, I think at one point in time, uh, was involved in financing Bima Gold, which was one of Clive's first ventures. So, so th- th- there's longstanding relationships there. But, you know, it, it's never easy. You know, we worked at this for, for almost two years back and forth, discussing the opportunity to potentially acquire the assets. And, uh, and, and it, was, it was never easy. And finally, finally I, I don't know what the, the trigger was from, from B2 Gold, but it was, it was essentially, uh, we, we, we think now's the time. Let's structure a, a creative deal for both sides, a, a win-win. And, uh, and we were able to do that. We were able to come to those terms and, and the, the terms essentially came to a valuation of US $100 million for all of the assets in Nicaragua. Obviously, two of them are producing. And as we've put out this year, we're going to produce between 140 and 150,000 ounces of, of gold production in 2020. And, uh, and, you know, we were able to raise, very challenging as well, uh, we were able to raise a Canadian $105 million to buy the assets. But I'll quickly just go back to the win-win in the sense that, you know, I think we have a very strong technical and capital markets team to be successful and geological team. And, uh, and then, you know, B2 will represent 34% of the equity. And so if we're successful, they're successful. And I, I think that's really important to create these types of, of, of ventures that, uh, uh, that, that, that is this kind of win-win scenario where, where we have what we have structured with B2 Gold. So, and, and, and then, you know, just what we see, um, again, we, we've been in the country for 10 years. We, we've gotten to know the geological setting fairly well. Um, obviously, there's a history to Nicaragua, and, and a lot of your readers will be familiar with that back in the 70s and 80s during a, a very difficult time for the country. Um, and uh, and I think I think out of that they there was a learning process that um, going through a nationalization process didn't wasn't very successful and actually hindered the growth of the company and the economic uh, means for the company and that and that's obviously changed so I, I think that's a very positive but uh, but and and therefore because of that history there's a very underexplored nature to the whole region and and that's what attracts us to you know initially to the Barozzi concessions um but that that it, that's that's sort of what attracts us to the whole region is is the fact that there's this really solid geological setting there's there's lots going on i think there's 14 active volcanoes um so there, there's just a lot of uh a lot of geological potential and that, and that's what our team the new market team sees at El Amon, for example uh, this this mine where B2 Gold has recently rediscovered the Elamon vein structure, which is, you know, five to ten to fifteen up to twenty meter widths of between ten and twenty gram material. Um, so it's, it's very exciting to be able to follow up on that. A lot of upside, we believe, on strike and down plunge of of the currently identified zone. Um, you know, right now we've got two drills. 
turning there and, and, and drilling down plunge of uh, a number of the zones that, that look like they have really good resource expansion potential. And, and, and again, you know, in that setting, there, there's a very large land package uh, where low sulfidation epithermal veins have been discovered and mined. So we think there's going to be potential to find more with a really focused approach. And then uh, La Libertad, this, this, uh, this mine's been in operation, both have been in operation for decades. B2 Gold spent, uh, I think, over $120 million building the mill there. It was heat bleach at one point in time. Building a, building a very robust 2.2 million ton per annum uh, processing mill. Um, and so, and so there's, there's a lot of good opportunity because today that mill is, is only running at about 1.6 million tons per annum capacity. Uh, and so the capital has been sunk. Um, and, and we've got to go out and find some mine life extension, some, some reserves and some resources around the mine. Currently, there's 450,000 ounces of resources. And actually, we're mining those resources. They haven't been converted to reserves. Um, and so, again, that's, that's opportunity for us to focus our capital on uh, resource to reserve conversion, to resource expansion, to new zones that have... Uh, have not been drilled and, th and there's a number of them that gets us pretty excited. So it's, the, it's that geological team that identified these opportunities. We were able to structure a win-win deal with B2. And, uh, and again, I, I think we'll be successful. I think B2 will be successful and it will be rewarding for all of our shareholders. So B2 took some of the, uh, the debenture debt and they took that and took shares, converted that recently, which, uh, so they took equity. Why we're on the subject, can you speak to what was the sticking point, Ryan? I mean, can you share that with us? Was there, was there, what was, what was part of the the terms over the two year negotiation period, roughly? What was an issue that maybe delayed it? Was there any sticking points you can share with us? And then also, why we're on that topic? Can you now share the capital structure where we're at today? Your guys's cash and debt situation, and of course now with B two converting, what's the key shareholder roster look like? So going to the two years of discussion back and forth. You know, B2 had been in, in acquisition mode since 2012, 13, 14. So they're really harvesting. They were, they were really planting and, and acquiring uh, things around the world. They had acquired Ojikoto in Namibia. They had acquired uh, Focola, of course, uh, and other things. Philippines, they, they acquired uh, CGA Mining. So they were going out and growing the business while the gold price was coming down. And, and, and a very smart decision during a time that was that was challenging in the sector. So growing the business um, and, and really working towards getting to a million ounces of gold production. And so our discussions had continuously been about acquiring these two assets that had become, in a sense, non-core for B2 Gold. They're a very small portion of their net asset value. And, and just the discussions kept happening. And, you know, they kept doing some different exploration work. And actually, uh, I think 2017, they started to do some drilling and, and rediscovered the Elamon Central uh, zone. And, you know, they, at that time, it was kind of a step back and said, well, we've got to do a bit more drilling here to understand this. Um, but also it represents, you know, 150,000 ounces of, of production to us. Um, and, and so they were still working on building and advancing and, and expanding for COLA. To get there, to get to the 1,000, sorry, 1 million ounces of production. So, you know, there was just volume back and forth. It really wasn't valuation. It was just more discussions about what they're doing, what we're doing, what we'd like to do. And then the structure of the deal was, you know, of course, we had to come to 100 million US as a total valuation. So, $40 million was paid in cash up front, $40 million in caliber equity representing the, the initial 30%. $10 million in a US 2% uh, annum uh, debenture, uh, and then $10 million anniversary payment that Caliber pays in October of, of 2020 this year. And the, the trigger that we put in place, the mechanisms that we put in place on the venture were the 2%, and so you know a small, small interest payment, but we could force conversion of that debenture to, 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 to you know, to, to convert it to equity um, at a share price and a volume, a daily volume trading average. We, we, we did that, as you saw, back in November. So we were able to force that and convert that debenture, you know, some, some uh, future debt into equity. And, you know, I think it's just smart deleveraging yourselves, always deleveraging. 
I mean, it's a personal, personal thing, uh, but it's also a, just a smart, a smart move to to try and pay down debt when you can. We were able to to do that, and uh, I think I think it was a smart move on on the the board and management's behalf. And then we have one remaining uh, outstanding, I'll call it debt, but it really it's a it's a it's a purchase price um, deferred payment to to B two, and that so the remaining uh, outstanding is 10 million to, to pay to them, which is October, 2020. Other than that, we have we have no debt. And uh, B2 Gold today is a 34% shareholder because of the conversion of the debenture. It brought them from 30 to 34. Management owns 5%. Uh, so, so we put, uh, I think a total of, I think it was somewhere between, at, at the 60 cent round that we that we financed at, I think the total number was, was somewhere around $6 million at that round that the board and management put in. And of course we've put in money into this into this deal as we originally discussed on the on the on the change of direction and uh, and the rollback for the last 10 years, uh, myself included. So our average cost base is actually <laughs> higher than than the 60 cents, but we felt look, now we're changing the the this the, the direction of the business completely. We think this is a great new opportunity and so we'll, we'll put some more capital into the, into the company. And so, you know, we're around 5%. Lucas Lundin owns 4%. Uh, institutions own between 30 and 35%. And, and retails between 20 and 25% um, from various relationships and contacts we've had over the years. Um, we have right now, uh, I think we announced our preliminary cash balance of $32.9 million. And we, we think that, uh, you know, 2020 is going to be a big year, a big, a big year of investment into these assets. You know, we're going to be doing $13 million. That's our initial view, uh, $13 million of drilling. But of course, along the way, if you if you have success, you know, you're going to you're going to really start to drill that off um, with lots of drills. And it could be an exciting time. So we're testing a number of different targets at both mines. Uh, and, and that's where the $13 million is spread out. It's largely focused, actually, probably 80 percent plus is focused at La Libertad because of the, the, the very limited mine life there. And and but also because of the number of undrilled targets that have been identified, so so that's pretty pretty exciting for us. Well, uh, I want to ask you about the plans for 2020. A number of things here. Have you guys prioritized? Obviously, uh, at this point, you guys are allocating capital to the highest priority targets to delineate more value. I suspect, and that that includes obviously uh, La Libertad. And then uh, the uh, the Pavon uh, target, and then also you guys still have some JVs going. Will the old assets up in the northern part of the country will those be looked at for full and open JVs? Um, what's the status with those, and what's going to be the priority? And then along with that, Ryan, if you can keep track here, what is management's plan as far as the capital that you guys do have, the cash flow that will be coming in from production? Do you guys see a need at this point to raise capital in the market any further? What's the status on that? And then finally, any further acquisitions? Are you guys looking at acquisitions uh, in 2020? Okay, I'll try my best here at remembering all those questions. We'll start first with uh, with the targets and, and where the capital is going now. You know, so first and foremost, we, we have four drills right now turning at La Libertad in the Libertad district. That that includes uh, the main Libertad area. Uh, um, you know, I'm going to say that, that that zone, uh, that 20 kilometer plus zone around the current operating underground mines of heavily underground, heavily antenna. And um, and San Juan that that are operating down right around the mill. And again, that's you know within 20 kilometers. Then you've got this uh, new concession area that well, I wouldn't say new concession area, but concession area for uh, a nearby probably about as the crow flies about 35 kilometers away from uh, the Libertad concessions that that we call the Amalia uh, concessions. And, and there's a number of targets that have been identified. There will be more. It's a, it's a, it's a whole new region and district for us. Um, but we've got one drill turning there on some really, really exciting targets that uh, haven't been drilled. Uh, good work done by B2 Gold. Uh, we've recently been able to uh, get exploration permits to drill that. You know, stuff like six meters of seven grams, five meters of, of 78 grams. These are trenches. So really high priority high grade golden soil anomalies and targets that, that we're following up on. Um, so, so, 
so we've got four drills turning at various targets at La Libertad, and, and as I mentioned, largely because we, we really need to expand resources. We need to make new discoveries and, and hopefully lead to new, new ore sources for the mine. Um, so that's priority number one. And, and leading into that is the Pavon Gold Project, or, or I guess following up on that is the Pavon Gold Project. Bavon is, is located about 250 plus kilometers away, but the, the infrastructure in, in Nicaragua is great. The road network is fantastic. Um, you know, people hauling, uh, you know, fruits, vegetables, uh, diesel, uh, all sorts of supplies around the country. So, so hauling ore around is, is no issue. Artizo miners do it. it it's, uh, you know, as I say, the road network is, is really good. And actually, Nicaragua has done a, the Nicaraguan government has done a really good job of investing in infrastructure, in energy, in roads, and we met the Minister of Mines, Energy and, and Mines, and he talked about you know how in 2006, uh, I think probably a very small portion, I can't remember amount, is maybe 40 or 50 percent of the country, the overall country had uh, electrical grid power. Now about 95 percent of the country has electrical grid grid power. So th so they have been investing in that, and so so the road network is good, and so that's that's part of the reason we're advancing this Pavon project, which we're in permitting now. Um, we're going through the permitting process of that of that now. We uh, we we think there's really good potential. We just recently announced an, an update to the Pavon project uh, resource estimate, which grew 300%. Um, it's 230,000 ounces uh, indicated, uh, about 60,000 ounces inferred. We, we see some really good potential along strike and down plunge to expand that. You know, in some of the historical drill intercepts there, are nine meters of 13 grams, seven meters of 16 grams, 20 meters of 4.7 grams. So uh, this is a low sulfidation epithermal vein system. Um, you know, not, not hugely wide widths, you know, probably true width is between five and 10 meters, but carrying some very, very good grade. And, and we've done some analysis about, about hauling in and around the country. And what we've, what we've, uh, what we've seen is, you know, you're probably somewhere between $25 and $30 a ton to haul or um, to haul or that distance to the Libertad mill. So we're, we're, we're going through the preliminary engineering work. We're, of course, going through permitting. So, again, that's going to be some, where some of our capital is going to be invested in, advancing that uh, through permitting, social work community, uh, doing some more drilling there, uh, land acquisitions, things like that. So, we're, we're working on that, and uh, and that could be a, re a really important uh, source of ore uh, with 2021, 2022. Um, and then switching over to El Lamon. El Lamon is is the asset in the portfolio where where we allocated most of the value in the transaction. You know, it's it's the asset that has I think a total of 300,000 ounces of reserves, um, well over 900,000 ounces in resources. Um, and particularly, a couple of the zones. Uh, there's two. There's three mines at Elamon. There's the high-grade open pit at Elamon uh, Central. There's the Santa Pancha Underground, and then there's the new Veda Nueva Underground. So, you know, B2 had advanced all of those. We're, we're we're now picking it up, and so there's three different ore sources, and we're seeing good exploration opportunity at Santa Pancha in a new zone called Pantheon, which we're we're drilling right now. We're also seeing um, at the Veda Nueva underground. So Veda Nueva, Santa Pancha are underground. And then what, what really gets us excited at Elamon is the, is the down plunge extensions and a long strike extensions of this high grade open pit that is now two and a half kilometers long. Um, we're mining the Limon Central pit. And if you go further to the north, uh, Limon Norte, which has uh, resources, uh, Tigre Chaparral, which has resources are all still very shallow. And the you know the widths are between between 10 and 15 meters at very high grade ranging from you know seven to to 15 plus grams per ton gold. So again, that's where we're investing some of our money. So the focus, Andrew, is really around the mines and ensuring we have what we say is track in front of the train so the train can run smoothly. And so that's why this is a, a year of investment into these assets. Uh, investment into engineering, into permitting, into drilling uh, to, to add value. And anytime you have resource expansion or anytime you have discovery, a discovery or new zone uh, identification, it, it should have a really positive impact on your company, not only from, a, okay, this could be ore feed, but this is an exciting new zone and discovery uh, for, for our shareholders. So 
that's 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 ongoing. And then if we if we switch over to the Barosi concessions, as you as you mentioned, you know we've we've had different joint ventures and earnings currently right now to the 876 square kilometer land package. We have uh, we have uh, uh, I think it's uh, one oh well, sorry it's it's one small venture with Rosita Mining and uh, and actually they've they've they're bringing in a, a, a external group to build a processing facility to help process old tailings and stockpiles of the Rosita mine and the Rosita mine produced uh, uh, millions of pounds of copper and uh, so there's there's some pretty decent grade uh, stockpiles uh, waste dumps and, and tailings that that are good for reprocessing so they're working on that and then and then we have a, a deal with I am gold where I am gold is earning into 70 percent they're cur- they're currently at 51 percent of uh, one of the concessions called the Eastern Barossi the Eastern Barossi out of the 876 square kilometers I believe about 170 square kilometers and, and these are again these are very specific geologically they're they're low sulfidation epithermal veins We've discovered over the last six, seven, eight years, uh, high grade shoots of gold and silver predominantly. We've had some zones that are very high grade silver, some zones that are very high grade gold. Uh, we've, we've outlined about 800,000 uh, ounces there now. These are sh- small, shallow, high grade pits and then would, it would extend uh, to underground. And we, we, we think uh, along with I'm Gold, that there's good opportunity to continue to expand that. And so I think this year they're also spending um, some money to earn into that 70%. So this year they'll get to 70% and then we'll make a decision about a joint venture going forward and how that's structured. So there will be some money spent up there uh, by I'm Gold this year. Uh, but, but outside of that, you know, we've got, uh, we've got a very large 256 square kilometer land package um, in the Sayuna district. That, that was an area where, where Centero was a joint venture partner. They've, uh, I mean, last year we announced that they, they stepped back from that and they stepped back from a number of the different earning agreements they had around the world to focus on their uh, operations. And uh, we had some good success with them. Um, you know, what, what, what was done was they would blanket the whole area with uh, uh, soil sampling, rock sampling, go in and drill a couple of the higher priority uh, anomalies, you know, one or two or three holes and then go to the next one and go to the next one. So. We, we think there's some really good opportunity within that uh, work that they did. So they spent, I think, a total of about $9 million and then converted that into equity. And, and, and they took, I think the, the final number was 2 million uh, shares of equity. So uh, a good, I think, a, a good outcome for Caliber. Even though they're not advancing the project, we get it back 100%. They have a small royalty. It's 1% and some equity. So... Uh, we are, in fact, looking for new partners up in the Barosi concessions. We think our focus and our best use of capital is around the mines in Pavon and, and down uh, down in the uh, the Pacific region. So, yeah, we're, we're actively looking for that. We've got some early stages expressions of interest and in some that have advanced a bit, but um, don't know what, what will come out of that quite yet. But some really attractive targets. You know, it was back in 2012. When we had uh, B2 Gold as an earn-in partner, they were spending money earning in. Caliber is the operator and always has been the operator for all of the, the partners. We were earning, uh, we, we were doing some work on a what looked like a pretty interesting bulk tonnage system. We were getting some good grades and widths and trenches, so we decided to drill a project called Primavera. And uh, with B2, we, we, built, we, we drilled it and, and we, we drilled into a, a fantastic great at surface discovery of a, a copper gold porphyry system. And, and that yielded some incredible geological exploration success right from surface. I think we drilled one of our best holes was 280 meters of, of 0.8 gold and, and 0.3 copper and very classic porphyry mineralization. So everyone got very excited because you, know, you find something like this, this can be a, a very significant game changer we continued along and, and in back in 2012 and 13, we, I think we drilled a total of 30 holes and it was quickly identified that a large fault had come through post mineralization and displaced a huge amount of the, of the, of the zone. And it's either down plunge, it's either up and eroded away or a long strike. We, we don't know yet. We've, we've done some additional work caliber has over the last number of years, identifying different targets and often porphyries cluster. 
so uh, so that's exciting, and we've we've got we've done some airborne work. We've we've done some uh, soil sampling and, and trenching and and uh, rock sampling work to identify a bunch of new targets. We've got a a slew of of new targets to drill, but we uh, really haven't done much work on that. So yeah, it, it, it's it's continuing to do that early stage work up there, uh, identifying new opportunities, and I, I think. I think, uh, you know, the, the goal up there would be to bring in a new partner so that we can focus on our assets down at the south. Ryan, I want to want to have you cover just a couple other things going back to what I asked before and just expanding a little bit. There are a few other companies in Nicaragua advancing assets. One notable advanced project is Condor's La India project. Thoughts on Condor Gold, and then can you go back to the cash flow situation and does Caliber see a need to do financing given where you guys are at now and what you've completed? And then is the management team looking at acquisitions in Nicaragua or even outside of Nicaragua at this point? Yeah, great question. Obviously, we, we know Condor uh, being in the country, not too far away from the Alamon mine. But but again, I kind of come back to this is such a new direction for Caliber. Uh, we've we've done a lot of work over the last uh, you know, six months in getting us to this place in time. And our view at this point in time is that the biggest value for ourselves and our shareholders, because we're significant owners, is focusing on uh, ways to incrementally improve the operate operate operations, whether that be through costs or additional production. And, and also allocating capital to the drill bit and really being focused there. And we've recently brought in uh, a new vice president exploration. His name is Mark Peterson, who is, knows Ray Threlkeld very well. And uh, he, he's, a, he's a well-known geologist um, that, that has worked for various companies in his career, Metallica, in that part of the world, Metallica Resources, that, and, and ended up becoming New Gold. And then he worked with New Gold for a number of years. Uh, so. We think the best opportunity is that is uh, is drilling right around uh, our operations, and we think that's going to have the biggest impact for our shareholders. So, so not really not looking at M and A. I mean, obviously, uh, you're always in the space and, and keeping your ear to the ground to 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 know what's going on. But but we want to make sure that we can we can re-rate the equity, or at least work towards re-rating the equity to get closer to peer average, uh, or or you know, in that vicinity, uh, so that anything we do in the future would be accretive. But uh, you know, we don't know what the future holds. You know, we we might yield some incredible success with the drill bit. If that's the case, we'll focus very closely on that, and and you know, maybe down the road look at at, at M and A. But for the time being, you know, we're really focused on the operations that we have and that we've just recently acquired. In time, yes, we'll probably be uh, open to the idea more so. But we just think we've got a lot of good. Uh, low-hanging fruit in front of us right now. No, it makes sense. And you guys are right here. Uh, and you guys have a lot on your plate right now at the moment to get things up and rolling smoothly. Let's just talk cost for just a moment. And then I want to move on to some other issues. Are there any key areas that management sees as areas operationally and also in GNA to cut down the, your guys' all-in sustaining costs? Do you see some opportunities there? We see some. I mean, they're, they're going to come, I think, more so over time. But, well, you know, one of the ones particularly that we identified right out of the gate was uh, we've got two ball mills and a sag mill. Power costs are, you know, close 19, 20 cents a kilowatt hour in Nicaragua. So one of the uh, first opportunities that we took advantage of was to shut down idle one of the ball mills because, um you know, first, that's going to reduce our operating costs pretty substantially. And we're already starting to see the positive impacts of that. I think, you know, we're looking at somewhere between three and 400,000 a month uh, on one of those ball mills. So a significant cost savings. And we are going to start to see more and more incremental, uh, maybe not as material, but incremental cost savings. And, uh, you know, for us, it's, it's a real focus because these are our only assets or only cash flow generating assets. For us, it's a real, as much as we can, a very laser sharp focus on margin and, and generating some, some good operating cash flow so that we can reinvest in the business. Um, I, I, I mean, this year we're guiding for an all in sustaining cost of 1020 to 1060. Uh, I think there's, you know, there's, I think there's good opportunity for execution and meeting that. Uh, I think there's also a good opportunity that we potentially could exceed that. So 
Um, we, we will, I mean, one of the great assets that we have in the company is this, uh, Darren Hall, a chief operating officer for Caliber. He was chief operating officer for, for New Market Gold. And, and, and he's, he's had a very long and, and experienced career with Newmont. I think he was total with Newmont was almost 30 years. Uh, he worked in all different jurisdictions, uh, Indonesia, Nevada, Peru. Um, at, at, when he left Newmont, he was overseeing all of, uh, all of the Asia Pacific region for Newmont, overseeing probably roughly 40% of their EBITDA. So, um, you know, very serious a very seasoned um, technical um, chief operating officer that also really wraps in the whole uh, capital allocation, people, uh, human capital, as well as uh, you know everything that that morphs into the the, the inevitable outcome, which would be that the goal is to increase your share price and be effective in business. So he, he sees all aspects of the business, and he and he and he and he's incredible at weaving it all together. So, uh, you know, having people like that in the organization is going to be very helpful when it comes to costs, when it comes to production, when it comes to execution. And, um, and I think that's probably uh, one, of our, one of our strengths is our people to, to be able to identify new opportunities for costs. Very well. Well, let's move on. What does management see coming out of the political debacle in Nicaragua, Ryan? What outcome do you see and how is management preparing and planning in the event things break down further? Yeah, I, obviously that, that's a topical discussion, you know, with what happened in 2018. Things were going so so smoothly, from from my understanding, um, you know, since 2008 and nine, the economy was growing. They were investing in infrastructure. Uh, a lot of really really good things were happening. Foreign investment was coming in. Real estate was was benefiting, and then obviously we had the, the uh, significant unrest in 2018. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would say it, it, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, you know, I think uh, 2021, there will be elections unless an early election is called. Um, you know, the Sandinista party led by Daniel Ortega has been in power for, for a long time. Um, but they've done a lot of really good things, I think, for the country, um, from, from what I can tell. But Caliber's view is, is really we, we, are, we are friends with everyone and aligned with no one, so we're 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 doing everything we can to to uh, ensure that you know that 10, 15, 20 kilometers around our mines, uh, we work closely with communities. We work uh, on our social license quite a bit to ensure that there's good balance. Um, most of the mine, both of the mines are are uh, employed by the local community uh, all around the, the mines. So. Um, you know, I think we, we have to take a step back and say, you know, it's, it's, it's like anywhere. You know, take U.S., for example, you know, who's going to get elected and what's that going to mean? One thing, one thing that I, I've recognized uh, now working there as an exploration company and now a production company is, is that mining is important to the jurisdiction. Mining is important to the government. And, you know, because of the unrest, unfortunately, mining has become more important uh, as, a, as a means of economic diversification for the government, for the people. So, you know, we, we will do our absolute best uh, to ensure safe and sustainable operations and working closely with community and government, but we can't, we can't predict and, and we can't um, change the outcome of what the future holds. Uh, and, I, and I think that's no, not, not too dissimilar to a lot of jurisdictions around the world. You know, e even the Canada's, the, the United States is the Australia's, you just don't know what, what, what an outcome could lead to uh, positively or negatively. And, and you, you focus on what you can be effective on. Yeah, certainly. And I agree with you. There was some very good times there. And, you know, the recent issues have, have certainly collapsed the, the real estate market there. And, and there are some some fine bargains if, if you're speculating on that side. And I'd say B2 Gold did a fantastic job the entire time, even during the rough times in 2018. They did a fantastic job of keeping the government relation wheels greased quite well. And I suspect that'll be a key pr priority for Caliber as well. One of the issues, Ryan, that we've seen come through, not throughout the entire group of investors and audience, but, but certainly some, they've been concerned with single risk jurisdiction. What is management doing on this issue? Obviously, you, you alluded to it in country here, what you guys are doing to keep things uh, well greased and, and the track ahead of the train. 
is it important to them for management to be looking to diversify once you guys get up and running? Um, is that being considered? And if so, what areas, what jurisdictions are you guys potentially looking at? Are you going to stay in Central America or look beyond? Really good question. And I also have heard that single asset, single jurisdictional risk is is the top of mind for for retail, but but a lot of institutions as well. And we're, we, we've been we've heard that uh, um, over the last six and, and twelve months. Very valid points, and 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 I I, I see that myself. What, what are we doing? You know, at this point in time, we're, we're solely focused on what we can do with the assets right now and, and drilling around the assets um, and targets that we've identified. So that, that's our sole focus right now. We understand uh, that, you know, we may not be a fit for a particular investor that's looking for less risk uh, for, for a multi-asset, uh, multi-jurisdictional base. At some point in time, do we think we'll get there? Probably, yeah. Um, but it's really going to be be uh, a step by step evaluation. It's going to be really a, a we we would like to see ourselves in say two to three years and two to three jurisdictions. But first and foremost, we we have to just focus on the assets and uh, you know as I say, uh, it just may not be a fit at this time for for some investors. For some, they like to get into things a little earlier, back a team that has been successful. Uh, back a team that has, uh, you know, done a lot of due diligence and 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 uh, review of not only assets themselves but jurisdiction. So so I I think from that standpoint, at some point in time, when the time makes sense, we we would look to to grow our our asset base outside of the country and and just evaluate all the opportunities on the table. It's not just going to be, okay, we're only going to be looking in one specific jurisdiction. You know, I think I think we'd have to look at what is going to be the most accretive. On a, on a cash flow or a free cash flow sh- per share basis, benefit to us ourselves and our shareholders to to sustain and grow the business. I think it's good you pointed those out. I, I think, first of all, you know, you guys in Nicaragua are one of the largest taxpayers. You guys are mm-hmm. certainly a, a large employer, but from a tax perspective, you guys pay a lot of taxes to the government there because you guys have substantial operations in the country. And also, this is your cash flow source, so mm-hmm. you can't upgrade and expand without without that cash flow. So I completely understand the position. What is the end goal for Caliber, Ryan? Uh, is it to build out some value as a mid-tier producer and grow with a pipeline with increasing production to become a sustaining mining operator? Or is management ultimately looking for a buyout similar to that of a new market? <laughs> it's a great question. You know, five years ago, I, I would have, if you asked me that question about Caliber five years ago or, or so, I would have said, make a new discovery and a buyout. <laughs> you know, as, as you all know, I, I mean, as a lot of your readers know that that's a part of our business. And, uh, you know, you either go down the path of production, um, acquisition to, you know, because you're always, you're always depleting your assets. So you have to find more. If you can't find more through your own means of exploration, drilling and discovery, you have to acquire it to sustain your production. And it's, a, it's an ongoing circle. So uh, with, with that in mind, what is Caliber's uh, end goal? I think it's hard to define the end goal without knowing what we know today. And, and that would be, you know, what, what are, what are the, the drill results gonna yield? Um, but I think philosophically as a company, we, we um, you know, the view is to build a strong cash flow generating, a well-run gold mining business, but a, but a financial product that would get included into indexes and ETFs. Look, if we were to make some significant discoveries like new market gold, you know, you start to become the bell of the ball and look at ways of how you can grow on an EV per ounce basis, on a resource per ounce basis, on a market cap per ounce basis and various things. And you go through the analysis and you say, okay, if we, if we merged with X, we could become that type of a company. Or if we, if we stood alone and we acquired X, you could become that company. So it's hard to define that, but I think we'd like to grow the business. But at the end of the day, we're going to do whatever's best for our shareholders. We're, we're going to do whatever's best for, for the shareholders of the company to, to make the, the best return for our shareholders. And, um, and we'll go through uh, various processes along the way. But, uh, but you know, uh, I, I think it's hard to define that. And I, th- I think if companies do define that early, then you have to be careful with that because then there's this social, internal social aspect that um, they don't want to leave or, 
but so we have to be flexible in that environment to ensure that you know if we're making an acquisition it's not because we you know want want to keep jobs and ourselves keep ourselves employed or whatever we we have to make sure we make uh smart decisions reviewed closely so that so that we can you know at the end at the end of the day see a share price higher than what it was before uh, and I think that's a challenge in this business is, you know, you get to a certain size and then you have to grow, you have to acquire. And, you know, we've seen the, the falls from grace in, in numerous different um, uh, organizations that, that were very, very high and have come down uh, over the years. And, you know, some of that is due to the price of gold, but some of that is just poor decision making. And, and, and we'll do our best to try and stay away from that and learn from the last 10 years. But uh, yeah, at the end of the day, we're lucky to work with, uh, you know, the board who's very active and engaged and, uh, and large shareholders themselves. So they really take a vested interest in the direction of the company, where we're going, how we're going to get there. And or if we decide to merge and step back ourselves and somebody else runs, runs the company. So it's hard to say. Appreciate that information, Ryan. And certainly we support the company. Uh, it's a recommendation over here at Smith Weekly Research and has been for well uh, going on two years. So we're certainly here and we certainly support what the management team is doing there. Just wrapping up here, Ryan, uh, real quick. We've seen recently a number of companies uh, that have been in a couple hundred million market cap range, Equinox Gold earlier, Mavericks Metals, et cetera these folks have come on and, and kind of took an early listing on the New York Stock Exchange. What's your view on that, um, given that some of these companies are only a couple hundred million market cap and they're getting into the New York Stock Exchange listing and also dual listing with the TSX? What's mm -hmm. your thoughts on that? Is that something that management will be considering over the next uh, one to two years? I don't know the, the rules and regulations and governances around around the, the U.S. listing. We're listed on the OTCQX and and I think that, that that's a stepping stone, I would say, towards potentially a larger main board listing in the U.S. But, you know, you do a cost benefit analysis to see, you know, do I want to go there? Do I want to spend the money? Do I then, if I do that, you really have to invest your time, senior management, myself and uh, CEO's time to regularly go down and make sure that you're educating and introducing the opportunity, investment opportunity within those centers in, down in the U.S. If, if you don't, you're, you know, you're kind of not spending your money wisely, uh, in my opinion. Um, so so it, it, it'll be definitely something that we review in the future with the volatility in the space, or at least the historical volatility in the space with regards to the gold price up and down and, and, and hard to map out. I think there's minimum uh, regulations. Uh, I think it might be minimum share price regulations that, uh, that you have to be careful with. Um, yes. And, and, you know, taking that into consideration, I, I think that would be something that we would review. But you, you definitely open yourself up uh, by a main board listing in the U.S. to a lot, well, <laughs> I think a lot more liabilities, but, but a lot more um, investor awareness, uh, a lot more of an investor uh, base that, uh, you know, they're the largest uh, sector in the world looking for investments. And so, therefore, I think it's definitely, a, it could be a, an opportunity to review pretty closely and see if it's a it's a value add. We haven't made any decisions there yet, um, but it could be something. As you said, as you know, if the company decides to grow and get bigger, um, there there would be a, a value to that, I'm sure, uh, to attract um, and and make it easier for investors in the United States wanting some gold exposure to have a, a locally listed entity. So yeah, we we, we would consider that in the future. I've been actually been surprised by the trend, Ryan, that uh, that these companies are actually doing a little bit earlier than I thought that they would do it. And it mm -hmm. seems to be kind of around that half a billion market cap area that they've been jumping on sh ship there with the, the New York Stock Exchange. But certainly mm -hmm. it's something to look at. And as you guys clear some of the current food off your plate and, and look for more of the dessert stuff uh, later on. For potential investors who are listening, Ryan, why should they take a hard look at caliber mining now? So, so in my opinion, I think we've done an effective job since we acquired the assets. You know, we've raised capital. Uh, we raised a hundred million in a, in a in a difficult market, in a market where people are starting to say, "Oh, maybe there is a higher gold price environment." I'll take a step back and I'll say, from a macro perspective, you, you really have to take a view on uh, the metal that we mine, and that's gold. 
if your view is negative, then we're probably not for you. If, you're, if your view is positive, a, a lot of times um, all companies in the sector, will, you know, if they're executing on their business, will have a positive uh, reaction to the price of gold increasing. Obviously, that means your top line revenue is going to be higher. And if you can be, again, effective with your business and hit the numbers that you've guided for, then, uh, then you can definitely generate some, some uh, positive cash. So there, there's that macro perspective first. I think that we're very focused on this and we see good opportunity. When I look at you know, different charts, it's, it's really hard to look at a chart and say, okay, you're undervalued, you're gonna get there. It's, it's really, okay, if these guys see opportunity, where are they investing? And we're investing a large portion of our capital into drilling. And you know, our board, most of our board have found, discovered, uh, expanded and mined probably in the in excess of 100 million ounces uh, in their careers around the world. So when those guys say, hey, we like what we see and we think there's a good opportunity to expand resources based on what's been discovered and, and, uh, and found historically. So yeah, a long winded answer here, but, uh, but if you, A, you like the, the sector, you like the, the price of gold and you think it's going higher, uh, and B, new company on a relative basis versus our peers. I think, you know, we we sh- we screen well. Uh, I, I think I think with that and and the fact that we have six drills turning right now, uh, four at La Libertad, two at the Elamon mine, and so one of the things I, I would say that's important for investors to watch out for is slow, uh, less communicative companies that um, you know don't have a lot of news, it starts to get lost in, in the competitive nature of, of all the new uh, and additional investment opportunities. If a company comes out and says, hey, we're going to have a news release every two to three weeks, drill results, financial earnings, you name it, et cetera, et cetera, that, that becomes like a book, you know, in a sense that you read on a chapter by chapter basis and it stays at the top of your mind. And the more that it uh, gets out there, uh, the more that people start looking at it a little bit closer, the more that maybe people start investing in it. So that's one of the things that I like about our opportunity today is that is that we we feel that we're going to be executable. We're going to be able to execute and meet our number guidance. We think there's good opportunities for additional ore sources like Pavon, and we'll be advancing permitting and engineering there. And as well, the discovery potential and resource expansion potential, I, I think, is pretty phenomenal. And having six drills turning almost 50,000 meters of, of drilling, and that potentially could increase. That's the base. That's the base minimum. So I think a lot of activity, no shortage of, of news flow this year, could be really exciting. Very well. And how can the audience reach out and learn more about Caliber Mining? Yeah, so pretty easy. Our, our website, calibermining.com. C-A-L-I-B-R-E mining.com. My information is on there. You can click there and, and click through to, to me by email or, or phone. I would recommend that. I mean, our website is probably very probably the first place you want to go to to read uh, news releases, to read information on the projects, to read our presentation. And so it's, it's important to do good due diligence and then uh, and have discussions with not only your friends, but people like yourselves, Andrew who have been working in the space for a long time. I always caution people, you know, if you read something and you feel like it's a good opportunity and you're new to the sector, don't just jump in. You really have to take a step back, talk to people, talk to different newsletters or analysts or people that know the space well to get opinions and to get educated on the sector before making any sort of investments. Otherwise, you can you can lose a lot of money uh, in the space. So you have to be really careful. Well, Brian, really appreciate you coming on to talk Caliber Mining, and we are looking forward to having you back again to update. Excellent. Look forward to it. And thank you very much for the time today, Andrew. It's an exciting story, Caliber Mining, and and you do a very good job of identifying opportunities, and you've done so for a long time. So I appreciate you having us on the show.